Okay, welcome to episode 8 of this podcast. We would like to thank everyone for joining us for another set of random questions for the bar examination. Okay, so without further ado, let's start with our first question. Okay, first question. A, uh, is there a difference between a house helper and a home worker okay again is there a difference between a house helper and a home worker and explain your answer so a house helper refers to any person whether male or female who renders services in and about the employer's home which services are usually necessary or desirable for the maintenance and enjoyment thereof and ministers exclusively to the personal comfort and employment of the employer's family okay so how about uh, if you are a home worker, a home worker is one who works in a system of production under an employer or contractor whose job is carried out at his or her home, the materials of which may or may not be furnished by the employer or contractor. But pwede sad nga ihatag, no? Alright. So the house helper is covered by the kasambahay law. So please take note of uh, those important points, no? That we need to be able to understand that it is uh, the house helper who is covered by the Hakasambahay law. Whereas the home worker is subject to the provisions of Book 3 of the Labor Code. The house helper works in another person's home, whereas the home worker does his job in the confines of his own home. So the house helper has a definite employer, while the home worker has none. The house helper has security of tenure, while the home worker does not have. Okay, so those are the answers. Thank you. Let's proceed now to the next question. All right. Okay, next question. Should a case be dismissed since the land registration case was pending between the parties? in another CFI or uh, CFI branch. Again, should a case be dismissed since the land registration case was pending between the parties in another CFI branch? So what do you think is the answer? Okay, what do you think is the answer? Okay, the answer is no, since the two cases are different. Uh, most especially if the other case is a pending case which deals with possession while the other one deals with ownership. Uh, if you look at a, the case of Spouses Medina and Bernal versus Nelly Romero Valdelon, no? uh, the example here is that there is a married couple. A married couple sued for recovery of possession of a parcel of land. The defendants presented a motion to dismiss on the ground that the land registration was pending between the parties in another uh, court of first instance, instance branch of the same court. So issue, should the recovery of the possession case be dismissed? The answer is no because the issues in the two cases are different. The first deals with possession, the second uh, with the ownership. Thus, the eventual decision is one will not constitute res judicata for the other. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's proceed to the next question. Alright, let's have another question. Which of the following is correct? with respect to the extent of the application of the security of tenure. Again, which of the following is correct uh, and res uh, with respect to the extent of the application of the security of tenure? Letter A, it applies to managerial and to all rank and file employees if not yet regular but not to management trainees. Okay, so remember this is... Uh, which uh, the question here is which of the following is correct with respect to the extent of the application of the security of tenure. Okay, B, it applies to managerial and to all rank and file employees, including those under probation. Okay, letter C, it applies to seasonal and project employees if they are hired repeatedly. Okay, and D, it applies to all kinds of employees except those employed on a part-time basis. Okay, the answer is letter A. Okay, it applies to 
managerial, and to all rank and file employees if not yet regular but to management trainees. Okay? So management trainee uh, are not employees yet. Okay, let's proceed now to the next question. Okay, next question. Uh, these are the facts of this case. A asked B to sell jewelry. But B, instead of selling, borrowed money from a pawn shop and as a security pledged the jewelry. Patay na. Okay. And uh, A asked the pawn shop for the jewels, but the pawn shop refused to give them up unless A first paid the amount Lent by the pawn shop to be. Okay. Now, the question here now is how would the court rule on this case? Okay. So, the ruling was that A can get the jewels without giving to the pawn shop the money borrowed by B because, because in the first place, the pledge was not valid, not having been done by the owner or his duly authorized agent. So, the one who really did the pawning was not really authorized by the owner. No? Uh, in the second place, there is no contractual relation between A and the pawn shop. In the third place, A had been illegally deprived of the jewels. <laughs> now, if we r recall no, in the civil code, if the person is illegally deprived, then automatically he will not be, uh, he will be allowed to retrieve the possession of that property. Okay? So, therefore, A had been illegally deprived of the jewels and finally, it would be unjust and unfair to the owner considering the fact that ordinarily, most pawn shops do not require their customers to first prove their ownership of the objects being pledged. So, delicado gid ka ay. Okay, so it's a business that requires a lot of risk. Okay, let's proceed to the next question. Okay, is a search warrant a criminal action? Again, the question is, is a search warrant a criminal action? Okay, what do you think is the answer? Okay, the answer is no. No, why no? Okay, if we read the case of Filipina Shell Petroleum versus Romars International or GR number 189669 decided February 16, 2015, the basic flaw in this reasoning is in erroneously equating the application for and the obtention of, uh, of a search warrant with the institution and prosecution of criminal action in trial court. It would thus ca categorize what is only a special criminal process. No? Yeah, only a special criminal process. The power to issue which is inherent to all courts is equivalent to a criminal action. So jurisdiction over, over which is reposed in specific courts of indicated competence. So it, it ignores the fact that the requisites Procedure and purpose of the issuance of a search warrant are completely different from those for the institution of a criminal action. For indeed, a warrant such as a warrant of arrest, a search warrant, merely constitutes a process. So, procedure na siya. A search warrant is defined in our jurisdiction as an order in writing issued in the name of the people of the Philippines signed by a judge and directed to a peace officer con commanding him to search for personal property and bring it before the court. A search warrant is in the nature of a criminal process akin to a writ of discovery. It is a special, peculiar remedy, drastic in its nature and made necessary because of public necessity. In American jurisdictions, from which we have taken our jural concept and provisions of search warrants because we usually pattern it from them. Such warrant is definitely considered merely as a process. So it's a process, not a criminal action. Generally issued by a court in the exercise of its ancillary jurisdiction and not a criminal action. Take note of that. It's not a criminal action. To be entertained by a court pursuant to its original jurisdiction. So clearly, 
then an application of search warrant is a is not it's not a <laughs> criminal action. Thus, the the rule that venue is jurisdictional in criminal cases does not apply there too and may be waived if not objected pursuant to the omnibus motion rule. So, uh, for more information behind the context of this case, you try to read again Shell. Filipinas Shell Petroleum versus Romars International, a case decided decided not decided no man. <laughs> February 16, 2015. Okay, let's proceed now to the next question. Okay. Simeon was returning to Manila. After spending a weekend with his parents in Saria, Quezon, he boarded a bus operated by the Sabit Bus Line or the CBL. Now, let's call it CBL in this case. That happened in August 30, 2013. In the middle of the journey, now in the middle of the journey, the bus collided with a truck coming from the opposite direction, which was overtaking the vehicle in the front truck. Through, though the driver of the CBL bus tried to avoid the truck, a mishap occurred as the truck hit the left side of the bus. As a result of the accident, Simeon suffered a fractured leg and was unable to report for work for one week. He sued CBL, SBL day, sorry. <laughs> he sued SBL for actual and moral damages. SBL raised the defense that it was the driver of the truck who was at default and it was and it really just exercised he really exercised diligence of a good father of a family in the selection and supervision of its driver okay so question is sbl liable for actual damages <laughs> how about moral damages what do you think okay uh, we also have another question. Will CBL be liable to pay interest if it is required to pay damages and delays in the payment of the judgment award? And what is the rate of interest? And from when should the interest start running? Okay. Okay, let's answer it. For the first question, is SBL liable for actual damages or moral damages? The answer is yes. SBL is liable to pay actual damages. So Article 1759 of the New Civil Code provides that common carriers are liable for debt or injuries to passengers through negligence or willful acts <laughs> of the former employees, although such employees may have acted beyond the scope of their authority or in violation of the orders of the common carriers. The liability of the common carriers does not cease upon proof that they exercise all the diligence of a good father. But I, that is not an excuse. <laughs> no? uh, even if you say that you have exercised the diligence of good father of a family in the selection and supervision of their employees. As to the actual damages, Article 2199 of the New Civil Code provides that except as provided by law or by stipulation, one is entitled to an adequate compensation only for such pecuniary loss suffered by him as he has duly proved. So if you look at what is pecuniary, that is relating to money. In this case, actual damages are loco cesante, no? loco cesante or the loss of a benefit that the plaintiff failed to receive. As to the moral damages, the same may be recovered in the breach of contract of carriage only if the defendant active acted no fraudulently. No? So you have to prove that. Pro fraudulently or ano ba yan? <laughs> fraudulently. Fraudulently. No? Or by bad faith. In this case, since the accident was caused by the truck and not by the driver in the bus, SBL is not liable to pay moral damages. So no moral damages. Take note of that. <laughs> okay, next question. Is CBL, no? Uh, will CBL be liable to pay interest if it is required to pay damages and delays in the payment of the judgment award? And what is the rate of interest? And from when should the interest start running? Okay, so the answer is... 
Yes, no. CBL will be liable to pay interest if a judgment to pay damages is given and it delays in the payment of such damages. So kung walang delay, di walang interest. When the judgment of the court awarding a sum of money becomes final and executory, the rate of legal interest shall be 6% per annum. So 6% per annum lang. Okay, so you divide it by 12 months, so per month. no. So you, you can have 0.5%. Eh? Tama ba? <laughs> okay. Uh, 6% per annum for, uh, for from such family until its satisfaction. Okay. Let's proceed now to the next question. Question. What are the qualifications for an act or series of acts to be considered as a crime of violence against uh, women through physical harm? So question is, what are the qualifications for an act or a series of acts to be considered as a crime of violence against women through physical harm? What do you think is the answer? Okay, the answer is the limiting qualifications for any act, series of acts to be considered as a crime of violence against women through physical harm are the following. First, 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 it is committed against a woman or child and the woman is the offender's wife, former wife, or with whom he has or had a, sex, a sexual, ano ba yan? <laughs> had a sexual or dating relationship or with whom he has a common child. Okay? And B, it results in or is likely to result in physical harm or suffering. Okay? So those are the two things that you need to take note. First, is it against a woman or a child uh, with whom you have a sexual relationship with, whether it's previously or whatever it is? It results in or is likely to result in physical harm or suffering. For more information, you can read the case of Dabalos versus RTC. A case decided January 2013. Okay. Okay, next question. What are the requisites? Now, what are the requisites of a valid quit claim? Again, what are the requisites of a valid quit claim? Okay. So the requisites of a valid quit claim are the following. First, a fixed amount is full, uh, the a fixed amount as full and final compromise settlement. Okay, take note of that. Again, first is a fixed amount as full and final compromise settlement. Number two, the benefits of the employees, if possible, with the corresponding amounts with the employees are giving up in consideration of the fixed compromise amount. Again, number two is that the benefits of the employees if possible, with the corresponding amounts which the employees are giving up in consideration of the fixed compromise amount. Okay, so that should be also one of the requisites. That's number two. Number three, a statement of the employer has clearly explained to the employees. Again, a statement that the employer has clearly explained to the em employees in English, Filipino, or in the dialect known to the employees that by signing the waiver or quit claim, so a quit claim is like a waiver, that they are forfeiting or relinquishing their right to receive the benefits which are due to them under the law. And lastly, a statement that the employees signed and executed the doc executed. <laughs> a statement that the employees signed and executed the document voluntarily and had fully understood the contents of the document and that their consent was freely given without threat, violence, and intimidation or undue influence exerted on their person. Okay, so that's the fourth requirement. Okay, uh, just additional information. It is advisable that the stipulations be made in English and Tagalog or in the dialect known to the employees. There should be two witnesses to the execution of the quit claim who must also sign the quit claim so there should be two people who should be able to witness such and they should be they should sign it the document should be subscribed and sworn to another uh, to under oath preferably by by an administering official of the department of labor and employment or its regional office the bureau of labor relations 
the NLRC or a labor attache, 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 <laughs> attache in a in a foreign country. Such official shall assist the parties regarding the execution of the quit claim and waiver. So, for more information, you can read the case of Eddie Staff Builders International Incorporated versus NLR as eh, oh. <laughs> NLRC. No, a case decided October twenty six, two thousand seven. Okay. Next question. What is the significance of distinguishing if a property is public dominion or patrimonial? Again, what is the significance of distinguishing? This is one of the significance uh, of distinguishing a property uh, is in public dominion or patrimonial. What do you think is the answer? Okay. The answer is because if it's patrimonial, now this is only one of the reasons, then it will be subjected to real property taxes. But it's but if it's a public dominion, then it's not subjected to it. Again, because it's uh, if it's patrimonial, then it will be subjected to real property taxes. If it's not, then there's no need for it. Okay, let's proceed now to the next question. Okay, next question. What are internal waters? Again, what are internal waters? Okay, so these are uh, are all waters part of the sea rivers, lakes, uh, landwards from the baseline of the territory. So you read about the archipelagic doctrine. No, are all parts of the sea rivers, lakes, landward from the from the baseline of the territory. Okay, we'll proceed to another set of questions. Okay. The next question is about a father, no? Uh, father before his death possess in good faith ex excess land for three years. Son accepted the inheritance and believe also in good faith that the father was the owner of the land. So nine years after the father's death, the owner wants to recover the property from the son. Okay, the question is, will excess action prosper? Okay, so what do you think? Okay, the answer is that no, excess action will not prosper because to the possession of the child, nine, nine years must be added to the possession of the predecessor, the father, not three years which is three years, giving the son a total of 12 years of uninterrupted possession. There being just a, a title succession and a good faith, you know, 10 years would be enough to give ownership to the son, not by succession, but by prescription. So please read Article 1138. It says, In the computation of time necessary for prescription, the present possessor may complete the period necessary for prescription by tacking. No? So that is according to Article 1138. All right, so let's proceed to another question. Okay, A agreed to sell his car to B for 200,000 pesos, the price to be paid after the car is registered in the name of B. After the execution of the deed of sale, A together with B proceeded to the Land Transportation Office, formerly Motor Vehicles Office, where the registration of the car in B's name was effected. When A asked for payment, B told him that he was 10,000 short and informed him that he would get uh, he would get from his mother. So, palaban is mama. <laughs> together with A and uh, together, no, both of them, together A and B rode in the car to B uh, to the supposed residence of B's mother. Upon entering the house. No? Horror movie. 
upon entering the house, uh, B told A to wait in the sala while he was asked, uh, while he asked his mother for the money. Okay, so while waiting. <laughs> so while waiting, um, you know, uh, in the in the meanwhile, no, on the pretext that B uh, had to show his mother the registration papers of the car, A gave them to B, who thereupon entered the supposed room of his mother, ostensibly to show her the papers. That was the last time A saw B or his car. Nah. In the meantime, B succeeded in selling the car to C, who bought the same in good faith and for value. So, question here is, may A recover the car from C? So, Indian to siya. Okay, so, question is, may A recover the car from C? Okay, so, the answer is... A may successfully recover the car of C because despite C's good faith and despite the registration of the car in B's name, still A had been unlawfully deprived of it. Consequently, A can recover the car and he does not have to reimburse anything to C. The doctrine of caveat emptor, so let the buyer beware, can apply here. C's remedy would be to go against B, his seller. The principle is in common law that where two innocent persons defrauded by a stranger, the person who makes possible the fraud by a misplaced confidence should suffer and can be applied in this problem because of the express provision of Article 559. So he can definitely recover. Okay. So what is the definition of arrest? No, again. The question is, what is the definition of arrest? Okay, what do you think? Okay, the definition of arrest is that arrest is the taking of a person into the custody in order that he may be bound to answer for the commission of an offense. Okay. Alright, so we have reached the conclusion of this episode. Thank you so much for joining and we offer our prayers now for the incoming bar examinations, although it will be it will be happening soon, but you know, for your preparations, you have all our prayers. Again, we would like to request everyone to please uh, rate this podcast five stars so that we can t- continue. We can really continue. <laughs> We can continue helping our bar takers and we'll be able to pr- produce more content. Okay, so just go ahead and follow and don't forget to click on the bell button so that you'll be informed if there are new episodes. Okay, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll join you. Uh, we'll have another episode for today in order for us to cope up with yesterday's episode. Thank you everyone and I'll see you in the next episode.